Now, Vipercore are truly disruptive. They're going to change the way of how you see how you manage your GPUs. First of all, in data centers, but actually they've got a plan how you're going to be managing data coming on and off those chips in a very, very special way. Watch this interview with Russell. It's going to change the world. Tell us the type of technology that you're looking to replace with Vipercore. So Vipercore is a processor technology. It's come out of the University of Bristol, not Cambridge, uh, yep. but we're, as a company, we're based in Bristol and Cambridge. We've got equal footings between the two. It's been 10 years in inception inside the academic circles in the same process of a search group that goes back to the 1980s. So there's a massive, big, long legacy and history of innovative performance processor design. And the, the biggest challenge these days is Moore's Law is only half of what it used to be. So we always talk about Moore's Law, we still talk about Moore's Law. And if you go back to the 1990s, Moore's Law did two things for you. First, it made your transistors go smaller and smaller, so you could put more on a chip, and yep. it still does that. And what it used to do, but doesn't do anymore, is it make those transistors go faster. Yep. Transistors do not go any faster anymore. When you look at the spec for your next laptop, and look at the clock speed on the processors, compare it to the spec of your last laptop, it's essentially the same. Yep, we've, meet, we've reached that physical point. Exactly that. So the physics has let, let us down. Um, so if you're looking at the really high performance stuff, the really compute intensive stuff like AI, what have we done? We've gone off and said, let's have a whole new architecture. Let's move the whole world over onto GPUs and make things faster, which is great, but you've got to rewrite all your software in a language that no one understands with a small army of people that know how to do that. So it's good for those niche applications and AI is quite a big niche, but the bigger you know, general purpose compute market has got nowhere to go. So we're looking there, at, you buy a laptop with more cores, you buy a server chip, CPU chip with more cores. The more cores you put down, you get less, less and less return because there's always some overhead in a multi-core solution. So if you're deploying something into the data center, you've got a, an application, maybe you've got a user base that needs 50 servers at peak time, but your user base is growing. The only option you've got is to deploy more servers. Yep. That cost money. They All about scale. All yeah. about scale. And you've got the, all the ESG stuff as well. The running costs go up, the, the power costs go up, they're burning through power. We're already talking about, can we power the data centers enough with the AI piece? Yep. Four fifths of the data center power consumption in five years time is still going to be general purpose compute. It's ramping up still. So that's the legacy is essentially, there is nowhere to go at the moment, simply deploy more servers and hope for the best. Yeah, yeah. So everything is getting hotter, more power, and the only way to do it is just do more and more and more. So the legacy technology that we're talking about today is just the only way that you see that is to just completely scale it through. So that's the legacy. So you came along and said, right, with Vipercore, we can see an opportunity there. So just explain to us then what you are doing in terms of being disruptive to that scenario that you've just described. Yeah, so the industry, the industry and academia, they all know about this problem that, you know, general purpose computers has got nowhere to go. So the, the default assumption in those circles is at some stage that the world, some university somewhere is gonna come up with a whole new way of doing compute. You basically rip, rip up the rule book, start again, uh, and then everyone's code has got to be moved across, et cetera. So what we're doing is we've looked in, uh, yeah, that look at your face. <laughs> so, so that, that's, that doesn't, that yeah, does, that doesn't that's, make any sense whatsoever. Yeah. I mean, over the long term, yeah. it could be made to go. Maybe AI could help us port the software, all sorts of things. But yeah, yes. in terms of where we are today, that's a long way off. Yeah. So the, the, the alternative way to look at it is look at how, how com current computer architectures are burning through their energy. Where are they spending their time? Are there shortcuts that we can take? And one of the things that comes out of this is when you look at how we run high level languages like Python and C Sharp and Java, they're actually doing, in terms of what they're asking the processor to do, it's way different from what C was asking processors to do 40 years ago. The trouble is, although languages have changed from C to Python, the processors haven't. You know, processors now are much bigger and faster, but they're essentially doing the same thing. They've got a, you know, the way pipelines work, the way caches work, it's exactly the same. So we're asking an old fashioned style of processor. Because it was designed yeah. before all of this came and, along. And it, and it carries on being that way because it's got to support all the code base yep. to run a very different type of software. The long story short of that is that when you're running an application in Python or Java or whatever, you've got something like four fifths of the CPU cycles are being spent not running your application, but they're basically running the stuff that maps the application onto the way the rest of the process is working. So the way I, I like to think about it, it's the swan gliding beautifully over the surface. And the paddling, of the and exactly the paddling feet. Yeah. Yep. Paddling feet is 80, yep. can be up to 80%. 
Yep. What we do is we've got a, a way of redesigning a processor so that we put all of that 80% inside the CPU itself, but without without being an overhead on what the CPU is trying to do. So we basically get those 80% of the cycles back for the main foreground task to do. So you get four, a four or five times boost in performance, and here's the clincher, without changing a line of your code. You just move your code onto our processor, don't change any of the code, it just goes faster. Right. Four, five times faster. Right, just backtrack to the bit where you started talking about the paddling feet, mm -hmm. because you talked about four, you talked about 80%, 80% of the power being used is managing the code, mm. not doing the job of the application. Yeah. So you've got your GPU, you've got your, your processor do, doing its job, 80% of the power is being used, and I take it the processing power as well. So 80% of not just the, the actual physical power, physical power, but coding power. Yeah, energy power, yes. Energy power. It, yeah. Face, yes. Yeah. Yep. Is being used to just manage data going backwards and forwards, mm -hmm. not actually do the job that it's supposed to be doing at that moment yep. in time. So that's actually the problem that you've identified. That's actually the, the you, you, you explained the big picture problem that you've seen, and then you've gone deeper down into the problem and seen that that's 80% of the power and the code. So if that is the problem, now just describe to me again, it's a little bit more detail, exactly what you what what you propose as being the alternative so you go in just go in just go over that process again mm -hmm. about where you see the alternative and so, so so what you're what you're actually suggesting is you're going to have a chip technology that's going to sit next to it and almost act like a sort of hyper memory type setup sort of thing a bit like that yeah. yeah. Am okay. I am I gone a bit left field there well, with that sort not, of you're idea? close you're close okay yeah. so just explain yeah. it then so so we talk about this idea of the swan gliding effortlessly, beautifully over the surface of the water. Yep. What are those feet doing when they're paddling frantically under the water? That's the, that's yep. the question people ask. So we, uh, if we talk about high level languages like, like Python and C Sharp and all, all of these, the, those languages uh, are regarding memory, the memory heap, you know, all the gigabytes of memory that's available. They see it as objects. So you can have a single line of Python which creates a million objects in memory. Those objects could be 32-byte text fields, or each one could be a database or something in between. Um, every time you allocate a piece of memory, uh, the background stuff has got to so go off to the memory heap and say, give me some memory um, and tidy yep. it up. And, and then yep. maybe if you're lucky, the program has done the coding so that they free up the memory later on. Yep. Not all languages, C Sharp doesn't have a free instruction. Yep. So, um, and everything's not as tidy as that exactly. anyway. So there's background code inside this runtime software, which is also trying to keep track. So, oh, that, that bit of memory is not being used anymore. Let's free it up. All of that allocating and freeing of memory takes time. Yep. So uh, we've looked at it, for example, just looking at regular C code, a simple malloc. It could take a few hundred cycles. It could take a few thousand instructions. And that's all time that you want, that you want your CPU to be running your task. Yep. And so through a combination of uh, of you know, the actual hands-on do a malloc or do a free or the background look for stuff that's not being used and freeing it up. And there's a whole bunch of second and third order effects because that all affects in a cache system. That's then affecting actually how much data, how much instructions are coming into the cache. You know, if you're running a background algorithm to look for code, then actually that's you've just lost your application from cache, so you've, hit, you've got a performance hit. So all of the th these, all these things, things are trade-offs. Yeah. All these things are decisions right. that you're making. So yeah. they all, that's, that, those things all stack up together to get up to eighty percent of the of the CPU instructions right. are essentially being wasted yeah. when you when you want them. I want them to be running my code, make it go as fast as possible. Yes. So what we do about that is we we found a way of basically allowing a regular processor to change its view of the memory map. So currently a processor says, my address space starts at address zero, goes all the way up to address lots of Fs, whatever. Um, and, I can go and I can go and see that address, so I can write to that address and nothing's gonna stop me. What we do is we build the uh, a separate module alongside the CPU yep. as a state machine that goes off and manages all of their memory allocation. It does the allocs, it does the freeze, it does the sweeping for back unused memory. And it does that in parallel with the CPU Right, and it, it's designed to understand the memory as objects, so it's the whole thing is optimized for the object model that these high level languages use. So we run all, we can run all this in, um, in so it's, it's part of the CPU. So we, our, our, our product is a processor in its own right, 
And it's, we, take a, we modify the existing architecture, and it could be risk five, it could be ARM, it could be x86. At the moment, it's risk five because it's an open standard and we're allowed to modify that. Yeah. So our product is a modified risk five processor with standard CPU with an extra, extra engine inside it. And that extra engine is then doing all this memory allocation for free as far as the CPU is concerned. Yeah, um, yep. but it, it's offloading it, constantly offloading it so that you reduce the amount of time it takes to, to manage code going backwards and forwards, yep. down and down and down. So, so where do you, how much, how much energy or time, whether time out of my depth physics, with physics here, so I'm not going to pretend to know what I'm talking about, but how much in terms of energy and time do you think you can reduce that down then? So if you take a typical G, GPU doing AI, for instance, how much, do, how much time do you think you could, time and energy do you think you yeah. can get? Because you use the 80%. So in terms of what's happening inside the CPU, we're seeing up to 80% of those instructions are being wasted and all of those, all of those come back. So yeah. if we have up to 80% coming back, that means up to 5x acceleration. Now that could be for, let's say you're running things in a server farm and let's say you're using 50 servers to do your task. Maybe you, you've got some customer facing web enterprise thing and at peak times you need 50 servers. So that 5X means you might only need 10 servers. So that's a direct yeah, yeah. energy reduction in terms yep. of how much, what's the energy difference between 50 servers and five and 10 servers. Yeah. Or my, my business is growing, I'd normally be buying more servers, but actually I can make those servers go a lot more faster efficient. if I switch them over. So you, you yeah. can either look at it as an energy saving or a performance boost. Actually what it boils down to in, in cold, hard financial terms is money. So it's a cost of ownership model. So you're looking yeah. at the total cost of ownership, what's the hardware cost of buying the servers, what's the operating cost, what's the energy cost, um, all the things that matter, all the infrastructure cost. So uh, as a technology, I should emphasize, the technology has the potential to work across the board. We have this phrase in the company, we go from toaster to server. Now we have yet to find a toaster with a microcontroller in it, but if we did, we would make it go faster. So, so you know, more sensibly, you know, white goods like washing machines, you know, people are starting to think about how they put more code in there to do a richer set of features, it's a better user interface. At the moment, all those microcontrollers are running C, but the number of C programmers is dwindling. So if we can help people put Python type apps onto those, at the moment, Python on a microcontroller is really hard. It's a you know, small amount of memory and a very low clock speed. We can come along and say, well, we can give you a richer environment to help you build Python into that. Then that's a huge opportunity. So, so microcontrollers is definitely one end of the spectrum. We then can go through edge devices. We can go through smartphones. We can go through laptops into the data center. So the technology has the potential say across the whole board the whole cpu space is there for the taking but that's going to take time so as a yeah, startup yeah. we have a go-to-market focused on data center server what we're going to do is we'll build a chip and put the chip onto a card and we sell that card into servers so we're selling it to the people that build out data centers yeah 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 so so you know we we with our community we call, talk about disruptive technology all the time and you know we'll do 250 interviews in a year and every now and then yeah probably to be careful about what I say because all these wonderful videos that we do but but most of them are really incremental you know I'm improving something by whatever mm. which is incredibly valuable incredibly important to the community because it's better than I had yeah. before I knew this technology came mm. wrong but what you're describing here is a completely brand new approach to managing a GPU or, or as you say in the future it doesn't have to be a GPU it yep. could be any sort of environment where you've got code going backwards and forwards, burning up lots of energy, taking up lots of space. Mm -hmm. And you're saying this is, a this is a completely different approach. It's a game changer. You're, yeah, yeah. You're, you're offloading, you're offloading all that energy, all that processing, and you're going to put it somewhere else so the GPU or whatever it is that's doing the main application. So you talk about edge computing, for instance, which is obviously massive at the moment in terms of uh, our community with IoT and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, doing processing at the edge and sensors and all that kind of stuff. What you're saying is, this is a completely different approach. I'm going to drop you in something that is totally different. Yes. Wow. This is this is a seismic change if we get it right. Viper Core. Cool name. Very good. So if that if that's the case, so I we by the way, here we're here when they're absolutely in the in the in the starting point of their life. I'm not sure it's the starting point you are, but you're very, very early. Very early. Yeah. yeah. So this this technology will 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 take time to come into the ecosystem. Um, when do you think it will come to reality? When a, when one of our community can say, because I think you've got a demo that you're going to show us. But mm -hmm. when 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 do you think realistically somebody getting excited by this can come to you and say, 
can I evaluate it? So we've got a step, we've got, we've got a stepped approach to getting this out there into the wild for people to play with. So the first step comes up uh, bef before the end of this year, we're going to have a version of the process of running in the cloud on, a F on an FPGA. So you get the AWS has an F1 instance, so we'll actually be running this on an FPGA and that will, FPGAs run slower than silicon. So in yep. absolute terms, our process of running on an F1 instance will be slower than whatever silicon you're running yep. on today. But you, it will give you an environment where you can take your code, put it onto our processor in the cloud. So number one, can you move it over without changing a line of code, which is the key point. So that will demonstrate, yes, you can do that. And the way we're running, the way we're hosting Python apps on, on that will allow you to measure what the performance would be in the real world once we have silicon. So that code, that, that F1 instance is, is instrumented with numbers that come out which say that on a like-for-like -like basis, yeah. it's going to be running X times So faster. you're going to absolutely be able to evaluate it in a virtual environment. Exactly. You're going to actually be able to be able to see what goes on yep. when you move the data over. Right? Yep. And then, okay. then the next step after that is about, we're about 15 months away. We'll have um, a test chip. Well, we'll be taping out the test chip in about 15 months to so give it a bit longer to come back from fab. So that'll be a chip which will have an eval board and that will allow people to, and by then we'll be hosting other software. So it won't be just doing Python because we're a small team, but we'll have ported Java and C Sharp and various other languages at that point as well. So that will roll out. So then probably 18 months off that, we then have the chip for the server environment, but we may have conversations going on by then with other processor yeah. vendors. There yeah. may be opportunities. More of a scalable type of exactly. solution. There could be plenty of other opportunities in the meantime. Right. Is this a demo you could show the show, yeah. the, show yeah. the audience now then? So it's traditional in, in all processor circles that you have to show Doom running on your new processor. <laughs> that <has> been... <laughs> why, why might that be? Why, why might that be? Because everyone, the coding bit is so easy. There's plenty of spare time on their hands. No. <laughs> so we have good old fashioned uh, 1990s Doom running here. Right. Um, so there is nothing optimal about our processor to run Doom. But the, actually, apart from that said. Sort of not the point, actually, but anyway. Well, the, except there is one point here, which okay. is that this All is. Right. this is a, this Sorry. Bit, well, no, you're absolutely fine. It, 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 you're right to that extent. Yeah. But the, the, the other half is that this is open source code which we have ported right. on. So again, I we're see. demonstrating the fact we have taken existing code yes. and moved it onto the platform. They're proof and points, it, aren't they? It just works. So we're not, points. we're not, you, you may notice this isn't going very fast. It's an FPGA. Yeah. We're showing no acceleration of Doom as Doom, but we are showing that A, we can run regular code and yeah. B, it just works without changing a line of code. So we, you know, obviously running on an FPGA here. I don't think we're planning to run Doom in the cloud, but I guess we probably could if there was an appetite for it. Right. Right. Um, but yes. So this is actually the process taking place. This is the, Jeep, the 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 FPJ. Sorry, the FPJ, using using your architecture in a virtual environment to see how the data is going backwards and forwards, and yep. you're saving power well, and you're saving energy. Our full process is running inside that FPGA. Right. And this code you're seeing on the screen is running entirely within that, and we're showing that it works. The new right. architecture works for existing code. Right. So that's very very interesting because. Um, if you go back and look at any of our videos, you'll find that uh, we interview a lot of people that say they're going to have silicon. In fact, they say they do actually have silicon. Mm -hmm. um, and they stick AI on their chip. And even to this day, I haven't seen anything. And more importantly, nor have they. But you're showing in a virtual environment this actually working. Yep. So this does actually exist. It does actually work. It's not an idea. You have a working model to show how you're offloading code into your environment, which saves that 80% of power, 80% yeah. yeah. of code of coding use, mm -hmm. so that the GPU can spend most of its time doing what you want it to actually do, rather than managing stuff going backwards and forwards. Yes, and this is actually our second generation. So we're not even at the beginning. This is our second generation of processor. What goes into the cloud end of this year is our third generation processor. The test chip is then our fourth generation. So we're refining it, adding to it all the time. It's, it's that there's a lot of work has gone into it just to get, to get it to this stage. Right, brilliant. Uh, I sort of feel like we've had a bit of an exclusive here, IPX community. Absolutely fantastic to meet Russell from Vipercore. I was going to say it again, Vipercore, cool name. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank really you. enjoyed that. Thank you.